morning. Um, so my name is Steve Osmond, as I've already been introduced, um, and it is, again, just wonderful that I can be with you uh, this morning. Uh, my wife um, and my two daughters um, are here joining me, which is really a treat for me because often I'm, you know, in far-flung places and they don't get to come with me. But uh, this morning, I am indeed blessed enough that uh, they were able to come along. So, um, yeah, we've been in the country for just over a year, as you can tell. Uh, this, um, you know, foreign accent of mine um, is uh, from a little further south. I'm from South Africa. Um, and, uh, yeah, just over a year ago, we moved to uh, sunny Scotland. Um, and are really <laughs> enjoying ourselves. I don't think I'm mentally prepared for winter. Um, even this morning, I was just freezing. I'm so layered up. Um, but anyway, yeah, great to be with you. So let me just tell you um, a little bit about uh, the ministry of uh, Solas um, before we get into uh, the message this morning. So Solas uh, is taken from the Gallic word for light. Um, and so Solas exists uh, to spread the light of the gospel into uh, the darkness of the world, showing the hope that we have uh, in Jesus Christ. Um, and we do that by doing kind of a few things, uh, two main things. The first is evangelism. So we'll go out to universities and um, pubs and cafes and restaurants um, and speak at evangelistic events on uh, some of the big questions that people have, um, answering some objections and really making clear the hope of the gospel of Jesus. Sometimes people I meet, they're sort of fourth, fifth generation. They've never picked up a Bible, never set foot in church, never heard of Jesus, never heard of the gospel. Um, and so it's just wonderful that we get to actually go and do that. Um, I, I spend a lot of time on university campuses. I think this coming Thursday I'm going to be at Aberdeen, uh, at one of the universities there, speaking on um, suffering and how the gospel brings us real hope in that. Um, and so just wonderful opportunities. So that's evangelism. Um, then one of the other main things we do is training, evangelism training. So we'll go into churches uh, much like this and we'll do some training uh, with folk um, and equip them how to answer some of the tough questions um, and also just equip them how to share their faith a little bit better, which I hope this morning I'll be able to, to do with you um, as well. We also have a whole bunch of online resources at uh, solus-cpc.org. Uh, you can go and check those out. Um, some of those would be short answer videos. We do these little videos around about four or five minutes uh, where we speak to, I think we have more than 200 of those videos now. And so you can, if you have a question that someone asks you, maybe it's a friend, a colleague, family member who has a tough question, chances are we'll have um, a short video answering that question. And so you can, you know, if someone asks you that question, you can, if you don't know the answer, just say, oh, I'm just, uh, you know, nipping to the loo quickly or something. And you can run off and go and look at that video and then come back. You know what? I've been thinking about that for a couple of minutes and here's a great answer. Or you can just send them the video, whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, we do uh, quite a lot of that. Um, one of our um, series, short answer series, um, is a series called Have You Ever Wondered? Um, so these wondering questions out of which um, uh, some of my colleagues uh, wrote a book called Have You Ever Wondered? I've got a few copies of those I can show you later. Um, and so, yeah, we do a lot, um, and we, we're, we're supported by local churches um, in many, many ways. So um, if you, uh, you know, check out the website and you enjoy uh, what you see there, um, how can you get involved with us? Uh, well, the first way is prayer. Um, like I mentioned, on Thursday I'm going out to uh, Aberdeen, um, and uh, just knowing that we have people praying for us as we go out uh, to universities, we don't know... We don't know who the audience is going to be. We don't know what kind of questions we're going to get. Um, we really need the Holy Spirit to be, to be with us. Um, so we would really love it if you would keep us in prayer as we go and do that. It just makes, it really does make all the difference knowing that we have um, Christian brothers and sisters praying for us as we go and share the gospel uh, in some quite tough places sometimes. Uh, the other is uh, to use all of our free resources. Go to our website. There's um, articles about how to share your faith. There's all the short videos I mentioned, um, podcasts, a whole bunch of stuff which you can um, just use and, and share and, and be edified by. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the third way we are supported um, is um, by local churches. So um, a big thank you to you guys as a church. Um, I do believe you, you support us. So thank you, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, that makes everything that we do possible. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about that, if you want to get involved with that personally, uh, come chat to me afterwards. I've got a couple of books with me um, that I can show you and, and gift to you as well. Um, right, so that is what we're all about. If you want to know a little more about the ministry, uh, come chat to me afterwards um, over a cup of tea and I can share a little bit more with you. Um, so this morning, we're going to be looking at 
conversations that count. Um, have you ever walked away from a conversation uh, kicking yourself and thinking that you'd really missed an opportunity um, and you could have said something differently? I feel like that's me every day, every week almost. You know, it's um, driving home after I've been doing a Q&A out at a university. I think, oh man, that was a good question. And I totally fluffed it. I didn't have the, the right answer at the right time. It's always after the fact that the answer comes to me. Um, or you're speaking on the phone to someone and you put the phone down and you think, oh man, there was something I could have said to that person and you just didn't do it. Um, or, you know, for me, it's uh, speaking to my colleagues a lot. Um, the two guys in particular, Andy and Gavin, uh, they just are full of puns all the time. Um, it drives me nuts. Um, and I'm never quick enough to actually have any puns in the moment, but always <laughs> afterwards, I'm like, oh man, that would have been really funny if I would replied with one of my own. Um, but anyway, this can be the case with evangelism too. Uh, feeling like we've missed out on opportunities to, to have conversations that count with the people that we love and sharing the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Uh, sometimes we really do feel like we've just missed out on opportunities. And uh, in, in the book of 1 Peter, especially um, uh, chapter 3, I think verses about 14, 15, 16, we're actually called to, to give a reason for our hope and, and to share that. It says, um, always be prepared to give a, um, a defense or a reason for the hope that you have. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And so there, that always be prepared is something that we can actually do. We can actively get more prepared to be able to have good conversations and start leading those towards spiritual things with the ultimate goal of being able to share the hope of Jesus. Because all too often, uh, it's, it's much easier to just keep that to ourselves, isn't it? Um, I, I, that's very much been, been my experience. Um, who here knows the, um, I think they're like comedian, uh, they do magic, comedians, and they do a lot of magic tricks, um, uh, Penn and Teller. Anybody heard of them? Oh, a couple of you, yeah. So uh, Penn Gillette, one of the, the duo, um, quite a big guy, um, avowed atheist, doesn't believe in God, has no time really for religion, but he tells a story about um, after one of his shows how he was signing autographs um, and somebody came to him um, who had been at the show and he thought, oh, this guy's coming for an autograph, but actually the guy pulled out a, a little New Testament and Psalms Bible and said, oh, I just wanted to come and give this to you. You know, I'm a Christian and I, I believe that Jesus is um, the Son of God and, and that um, in Him we can have eternal life. And so I really wanted to just give you this New Testament. And he wrote a little message in the front for him. And now anybody who knows um, Penn Gillette will know that um, that, that's a really scary thing to do because he's a, he's a big, scary-looking guy, um, but also very, very quick and usually would, you know, kind of take someone apart for sharing their faith. He has you know, no time for religion. But uh, he did a video where he reflects on this little interaction, and he said how he had so much respect for that guy because he knew how hard it was for him to come and share his faith with him. And then he said something that, that really stuck with me, and it's that, how could you be a Christian, basically appealing to Christians, how could you be a Christian, believe what you believe about eternal heaven and eternal hell for those who don't believe in Christ, and not share your faith with someone? He says, so he has so much respect for those who he completely disagrees with, but they would actually share their hope in Jesus Christ with those who would keep it to themselves. Because his words were, how much do you have to hate someone to not tell them about eternal life in Christ? Even if you didn't believe it, like, you know, to tell someone. And that, I thought, was really, really good. So I just tell you that as a, a bit of a, a motivation that it, it's true. For me, if, if this is true, if the gospel is true, if Jesus Christ really is the Son of God, risen from the dead, and in Him is eternal life, how could we not want to be sharing that with people, our friends, our family, colleagues, anyone we come across in the streets? It's, it's, it's the best news ever. And we, we have to be sharing that. And that's what... Uh, our Lord himself compels us to, and that is what the whole testimony of the Bible is about, sharing that faith. But conversation can be tricky. I know that. So this is where we're starting this morning, conversations that count. Um, I got my first job as I left high school when I was 18, and I started working at a small um, personal training practice, we were doing one-on-one -on -one sessions. So it would be me and one person for an hour, and we would uh, do these sessions, and that's quite hard. You have to get very good at having conversation uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we would have uh, clients aged 14 up to 85, 
Um, and on the sort of the face of it, it's, there's not much that an 18-year-old myself and an 85-year-old have in common. And so it was tricky just, you know, for an hour long, one-on-one, -on -one, just get conversations going. And so that was, for me, as it were, uh, the training ground uh, for learning how to have good conversations, because it is a skill that you can learn. But looking back at that time, um, I wish that I'd known just some of the um, tips that I'm going to be giving you this morning from um, uh, what we see in Matthew, uh, the book of Matthew, um, because I think it would have made me, number one, seem far smarter than I really am, um, and also seem uh, more interesting, but it would have also moved the conversation along for us to be able to have more meaningful and deep conversations, ultimately leading me to be able to share my Christian faith with the people I was speaking to. Um, and so it might sound strange, or seem strange, that I work for an evangelism ministry, um, but I do not consider myself a natural evangelist. Um, I, not, not really. Um, you know, after I became a Christian, uh, my, there weren't uh, revivals breaking out in my friend circles. Um, and, and you might ask, well, why was that? And it's purely because you know, I just wasn't sharing my faith with them at all. The thought of sharing my faith was something that honestly made me really, really, really nervous. And I'm sure that for some of you sitting here, the idea of sharing your faith also makes you a little nervous. Uh, you know, what would people think? Um, uh, what, what if I'm, it, it just seems really, really awkward. What if I offend them? Or I, I'm not good with this. Where, where do I even begin? Um, afraid of standing out, looking like a fool? Or what happens if they have hard questions that I don't know how to answer? These things sort of stop us from sharing our faith. But looking back over the years after, you know, all these conversations that I've had, um, you know, conversations um, about faith with my friends, I think many of those things that you see were actually just in my head. Because honestly, for the most part, in my experience of sharing my faith over the uh, last few years, um, people have really mostly actually been happy to speak about it once you are you know, non-threatening and you get the conversation going. But given our culture at the moment, I feel like it's probably even tougher. The challenge is even harder because we live in this age of relativism where, hey, it's true for you, but not for me. Um, don't force your truth on other people. It's this hypersensitivity, um, a lot of suspicion of those who, who seem to have the truth and are going to wield it as a weapon. And so the attitude really becomes, hey, you know, it's great that you have your faith, but let's just keep that private. That's a personal thing. Keep it at home. Don't bring it into this, the private square. So you do get a lot of that. It, it's true. And um, I was feeling that many years ago, and that also led me to not share my faith. So what changed? What moved me from nervousness and, and, and being really scared to share my faith to actually moving to a point where I'm actually feeling, you know, like I love it. I love sharing my faith and speaking about Jesus. What changed? For me, it was two main things. The first was knowing that there are actually really good answers out there to the tough questions. That changes things, but that takes some learning, sure. Um, and the second, and I think the one that was even more so helpful to me, was learning to ask good questions. Um, learning to ask good questions. This has really been something that has made talking about faith a lot easier for me over the years. Um, and the wonderful thing is that we can all learn how to do that. We can all learn how to do that. It might um, surprise you or not that Jesus himself was confronted with pressures not all that different from what we feel today. Well, what do you mean? I hear you say Jesus lived uh, around about 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. Here we are in Scotland in 2024. Uh, yes, the weather is slightly uh, different. Um, one of my favorite new adjectives is the word drich. I've learned that one. I use it a lot. Uh, sadly. But anyway, uh, Jesus faced a, a climate um, that was you know, not so unlike ours, where he was expected to toe the line, say the right thing, and not offend people. Um, but he, he wasn't afraid to speak the truth in love. And he was also very, very, very good at asking questions as a way to get there. So, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be around about Matthew 21 and, and specifically in 20, uh, 22. But in Matthew 21, Jesus has just been teaching uh, the crowds about the kingdom of heaven. 
using all these parables. If you look at that whole section from Matthew 21 into 22, there are a couple of parables. And Jesus is using these parables to share about the kingdom of God. And so the, the people who are listening are marveling at his words. Um, the Pharisees, however, have been on the receiving end of some quite tough criticism from Jesus for their religiosity and especially their hypocrisy. Okay, so that happens all through 21. And then you get to chapter 22. And specifically off the back of this, we're going to look at um, verses 15 to 22. So follow along, but it is on the screen. So after this, after Jesus has uh, made some quite tough remarks to the Pharisees, now their noses are out of joint and they're not happy about this. So then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, Jesus, in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of great integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. See, they're, they're kind of buttering him up um, at this point. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? That is a very tough question given the time. Now, why is that? Well, first century Israel was a land occupied by Roman armies who were considered by most pious Jews to be evil oppressors. And so paying your taxes seemed like it was to be collaborating with the enemy, these, these Roman enemies. But to not pay your taxes was an act of sedition, right? Um, and that could lead you to being arrested or being even executed. So what the Pharisees are doing here is laying a very, very clever trap that they're trying to spring on Jesus. So we're often worried about speaking, you know, that speaking about our faith will make us look awkward or get us in trouble at work or whatever. Um, but Jesus here is faced with a challenge where if he says the wrong thing, he may very well end up in prison or lose his life for it. So how does Jesus answer? Personally, I wish he'd said no. Uh, you don't have to pay the tax because that means we could default on taxes and still be very, very holy. Um, yeah. But if he'd answered no, he would have been arrested. Pretty simple. If, on the other hand, he had said, yes, you should pay the tax, in the eyes of the Jews, he would have been morally compromised. So basically what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we're laying this trap for Jesus. If he answers no, it's going to be trouble. If he answers yes, it's going to be trouble. A dilemma. What does he do? Um, and so this question isn't actually about the taxes. It's about moral compromise. That's what the Pharisees are really trying to get at. They want to know how, at what point is it okay for them to morally compromise. So this is what Jesus replies. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the taxes. So they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is on this? And whose inscription? Well, oh, Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give back to God what is God's. You see, they were trying to trap him. They were trying to stick him on the horns of this dilemma. And what did he do to get out of it? Well, he asked a good question. He averts the confrontation um, and the dilemma, and essentially Jesus puts himself in the driving seat by asking a good question. And so now uh, that the, the tension is dis diffused, the, the Pharisees have to actually start answering some questions. So the Pharisees are stumped. Jesus redefined the question in such a way as to say, yes, it's, it's right to pay your taxes when it's appropriate. Okay, but the real issue here, Jesus is saying, is what we give to God. Okay, so Jesus used it and he asked a good question to, to number one, sort of ease the tensions, to pull back, sort of get in control, and then make them start answering some questions. And he avoids the dilemma. And that is the power of good questions. The power of good questions. You see, Jesus knew the power of good questions. And if you just read through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus asks question after question after question. It's, I think more than 300 questions are recorded for us um, through the Gospels that Jesus asked. And so I think for me, um, today we're speaking about you know, conversations that count. And I think here we have something absolutely golden that our Lord demonstrates for us. And that is the power of asking questions. 
Maybe instead of thinking that we need to have all of the answers all of the time, rather we need to just start by having the right questions. So, on that note, imagine the scene. You're sitting at your local Costa Coffee um, with your favorite top arm that has John 3.16 printed on the back. I know we all have one of those in our cupboard somewhere. Um, getting your morning fix of caffeine. Um, you know, you're listening to your, your favorite music, best of Scottish worship 2024 maybe. Um, and someone, obviously noticing your, your fine shirt and overhearing the music somehow, um, taps you on the shoulder. Quick as a flash, you pause the music and look up with joyful Christian inquisitiveness, as we all would, um, only to be met by the stern gaze of someone from the local atheist club down the road. And their opening line isn't, oh, could I have the sugar, please? But it's, hey, what's up with the top? Why the Bible verse? What have you got there? Don't you know? And then they start rattling it all off. Didn't you know that science just proves God? The Bible's full of errors. Jesus didn't exist. Miracles are impossible. Christianity is a, a made-up religion to oppress the masses. It's sexist. It's genocidal. And it promotes slavery. Everyone around you stops, their heads turning surreptitiously to see what the Christian has to say. And it's dead quiet. You can cut that thick air of tension. Anyway, now, in that moment, you're faced with some options, aren't you? Um, you can decide to live out your three score and ten and just hightail it out of there, sandwich in hand, maybe. Or you could start trying to answer every single one of these objections, uh, which I can tell you um, won't, won't go anywhere. As soon as you start trying to talk, it probably just gets spoken over and it's just too many to be bombarded with. So what do you do? Perhaps instead, we could take Jesus' lead on this one and ask a good question. Ask a good question. Uh, ask a, a conversation opening question and diffuse the tension at the same time, just as Jesus did in that example we saw. So with that very strange uh, scenario in mind, let me share with you three good questions that you can use in just about any situation, um, including this strange one, that will help you have a, a, a conversation that counts um, and begin to open the door that moves to being able to share the gospel. So, three good questions. Three good questions. The first is, what do you mean by that? I'm going to give you three questions, and these are really easy, really memorable, um, like a little Swiss Army knife that you can carry around with you just about anywhere. And the first is, what do you mean by that? All too often, I think, as soon as we hear a question or something, we want to leap into explaining it. Okay, and defending, but we haven't really understood what the person is actually asking us. We haven't understood what they mean by the words that they're using. Right? So this is called equivocation, if you've heard that term before. Here's an example. When I say God, I have something in mind. I mean the all-powerful, personal, all-loving, all-knowing, um, sustaining cause of the universe. I think that's what the Bible gives us in a, in a little summary. That, that's what I mean when I say God. I mean the God of the Bible. But when someone else uses the word God, they may very well mean something very different. I mean, you look at all the movies around at the moment, and it's Thor and Zeus, and these are these you know, powerful beings that have these superpowers that fly around. And they may think that that's what you mean when you say God. Okay, but I don't believe in, in those gods. And so the what do you mean by that question helps us get more clarity and information about what the other person is actually talking about and to rightly understand what they're getting at. So think of our cafe friend that we met a moment ago. Um, you know, you, you might say to them, what do you mean science disproves God's existence? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Or what do you mean that the Bible promotes slavery? What do you mean by, by slavery? Or you could say, hey, you used the, the word God there a couple of times. What do you mean by God? What kind of God is it that you don't believe in? So this will, if nothing else, help buy you a little bit of time. Uh, not all of us are as quick as we would like to be. I, I certainly am not. Um, and so asking that what do you mean question actually it, it gets the other person talking, gets them unpacking things uh, for a little while and having to do some explaining. While you can gather your thoughts, think about what they've said, and think about your next question or explanation or answer. So that's the first question. The second is, why do you think that? Why do you think that? 
Now, um, now that we know that the person, uh, what they mean by the question um, or the objection, because we've asked that first question, we can now move to the why question. Okay, it's uh, very often mistakenly thought that Christians are the only ones who need to um, have answers for things. Okay, maybe you've heard a skeptic say something like, the burden of proof is on the one making claims. You know, oh, I don't make any claims. You're the one making claims, so you have to um, show me all the evidence and all the proof. But I think that's just a, a kind of pop slogan. You see, all propositions, all statements require justification. If you can recall your grammar class uh, from, from high school or wherever, um, a sentence is a subject joined by a copula to a predicate. Subject, predicate. Something like, Stephen is handsome. You could throw an adjective there, Stephen is very handsome. Uh, but anyway, the why do you think that question starts to pull out the justifications that people must have. And it gets the person to start thinking about and communicating the reasons for their proposition or the reasons for the statements that they're making. Often people just say stuff. They've never really thought it through. They've never actually stopped to dig deeper into it. It's something they've just heard out there. And then they just throw it at you. And if you just stop and say, well, why do you think that? Hmm. Now they're thinking. And that's great. That's a conversation opener. And that's what we want. Okay. So, again, back to our cafe conversation with our uh, new friend we've made. You could say, well, thank you for the clarification. After you've asked them, what do you mean by that? They've given some clarification. You say, oh, thank you. Um, but what led you to the conclusion? Why do you think the Bible is untrue? Or why do you think the Bible promotes slavery? And this is something that opens up dialogue rather than shutting it down, which is the starting point for any kind of good conversation. That's where we want to go. So the why do you think that question gets that conversation moving along and moving deeper. And that's really important. Why? Because as the conversation progresses, you'll be able to keep speaking about faith-related things. You'll even be able to open up the Bible with them. Seriously, you can do this. Think about the, the, the slavery objection. You could say, okay, well, I've heard, you know, you've asked them why, and they don't really have a good example to give you of why they think the Bible uh, promotes slavery. You could say, well, have you ever thought about Exodus 21.16, which clearly outlaws slavery? And then off the back of that, you could open up the Bible, show them that, and then say, but you know, there is actually a, a slavery problem. And that's the, the problem of the slavery of sin. And we're all slaves to that. And you can tell them about how God in Christ Jesus came to set us free from that slavery and we have new life in him. That's, that's really easy. I mean, they, are, they had the objection. You could open the Bible. And now you're suddenly on to being able to try and share the gospel with them in some way. And so this opens up the door uh, to move the conversation uh, towards the gospel in some way. Okay, so that's just one example. But what about our friends and family and colleagues who aren't full of objections, or who aren't full of questions, but they just seem to not care at all? What happens if they're just completely apathetic or uninterested? That's harder. Um, and that's where our next question, um, I think, is really, really helpful, although it might take a little more practice. And so here is that third question. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered? And this is a great question you can use with people who are very uninterested, apathetic, seem to not care at all. Because although our culture is very, very secular, nevertheless, it's still really, really passionate about a lot of stuff. It truly is. Um, you know, a lot of the issues and questions that people are passionate about actually just don't make sense in a godless universe. Well, what do I mean by that? Think about it. People are concerned with things like um, meaning and hope and truth um, and love and justice and ethics, all these big things. I mean, these are the headlines everywhere. Uh, people are very concerned about these things, um, but they just don't make sense if there is no God, if all we are is the product of blind, random chance, and all there is is the material stuff that we're made of. These things just don't make sense. And so these are then incredibly fruitful areas that we can use to move conversations to spiritual things and very quickly become gospel-oriented. Here's just one example of that. Um, think about love. Think about love. Um, there's a guy who does a lot of speaking on university campuses, and he was um, 
sharing, uh, I think, um, about the, the Bible being reliable. Um, and afterwards, a student came to him and said, you know what, um, I'm, just, I'm just not into this religion stuff. Not into it at all. So this guy, being quite quick, said, oh, okay, well, what are you into? And the person said, well, I'm, I'm just into love. And it was this guy and his girlfriend standing next to him. And he said, oh, okay. This guy's very quick. He said, um, okay, you're into love. Well, well, what is love? Have you ever thought about what love really is? And the guy thought for a moment and he said, you know, I haven't actually thought about that. I, I don't know. What, what do you think love is? I said, well, let, let me give you this as a, a definition very quickly. Um, love is simply uh, the chemical reactions in your brain that you've evolved to have so that you'd be able to find a mate and pass on your genetic information. And the guy said, yeah, maybe it could be that. Very quickly he got a nudge in the, in the ribs from his girlfriend who was standing next to him. And he said, no, 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 actually, that, that can't be it. No, no, it, it's, it's much more than that. It can't just be that. And so this guy said, oh, well, well, that, well that's good. But if there is no God, how could it be more than that? Because... You know, if there's, if there's no God, all we are is the physical stuff, so that's what it has to be. So the guy said, well, well, what do you think love is? Oh, well, suddenly this person cares about love and they're willing to open up the conversation. And so this guy then was able to go on and, and explain the gospel through this question, saying, well, you know, I believe we're made in the image of God, that we have free will, and free will is being able to, to, to direct our affections and our love towards someone through commitment and self-service and self-sacrifice, that's really what love is. It's much more than, sure, there's a chemical aspect to it, um, infatuation, but love is so much more than that. And it is ultimately expressed in that God himself loves us. Have you ever heard John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. You know, we were over here. This person didn't care about religion. Now, all of a sudden, you're able to just share some verses and share how love only makes sense if there's a God. That is what these questions can do. For time's sake, I won't do another example of that. But the point is that these questions, this have you ever wondered question, taking these, these things can act as a wonderful door. Um, through this question, we're able to move conversations um, to conversations that count by using things that people are already very, very passionate about and showing how they only make sense if there is a God. And even more so, that, that, that through them there is a much better explanation for them um, in the gospel, in the truth of Christianity. Here's a, another way of thinking about these questions. Here's an island. Imagine um, a very small little island, and there's someone on this island. Um, it's all they've ever known. They've grown up on this island. Don't ask how, how they got there it's for the illustration, but they're on this island. Um, it's small. They know the... The, the bushes and the, the little forests and the hills and all the trails, they know the beaches. This island is the whole extent of their existence. Okay? But every so often they walk along the beach. And as they're strolling along the beach, they see um, a bottle or, or a piece of wood with an inscription, something that's broken off from a ship, and it's, it's washed up on their beach. And as they bend down and pick it up and start looking at it, they know that there's something else out there. As much as this is just a little island, there's something that's washed up on the shore. And so they know that there's something beyond the shores of their immediate experience. There's another world out there. In the same way, these experiences, our yearning for justice and our resonance with beauty and our, our, um, our occupation with, with, with wanting to, to fix the environment and preserve the environment, or love, as I mentioned, or, or the idea of loneliness and why it's so strange and unnatural, or death, why, why it haunts us and why it feels like it's, it's, it shouldn't be part of this, of this world. It, it seems, again, unnatural to us. All of these things are really, really useful in that they keep washing up on the shores of our daily experience. And we can use those things to point people to another world, and that is ultimately the world in which there is a God who stands up over all of these things. And because we're made in His image, he has programmed these things onto our hearts. And we can use that because we know all people are made in the image of God. And so we can appeal to that to point people toward him. So there are your three questions. They're really, really simple. You can take them around wherever you go. Um, what do you mean by that? Why do you think that? And have you, have you ever wondered? Easy, memorable questions. You see, the gospel, and only the gospel, 
answers life's biggest and deepest and toughest questions um, that our, our colleagues and friends are asking. You know, questions about our purpose in this world or about the meaning of life, um, our significance, identity, hope, um, ultimate justice to come. It's only the gospel that truly, truly speaks to these things. And so my prayer is that all of us as, as followers of Jesus who have, who have been, uh, we've received this grace, we've received this gospel, and we live in that with the amazing grace of eternal life. That is, that's not just life to come. That's life now. That, that eternal life, it's eternal in its extent, it, it, eternal in its power. And that life through the Spirit is what gives us hope now in this life, but is also eternal in, its, in, in duration. And that, that is the hope we have of, of heaven to come. That is what we have. And so my hope and prayer is that we would all have the boldness to start asking good questions, start having better conversations, start going to places where, where there are people who believe different things to us. I think so often that's one of the hardest things is that we don't know other people who believe different things. That's true of me. I know I have to work hard to make uh, friends who aren't Christians who believe different things so that I can start talking to them and start sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with them. Um, it's Jesus who said that I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. And as people who have received that grace and received that life, how could we not, with a deep, deep passion and love for other people, want to go and share that very life with other people? That is what we're called to, and that is what I believe God will equip us for. It's really hard sometimes, but you know, we're, we, God, God can use us, and He calls us to this, but ultimately, we know that it's the Spirit who, who calls and draws and transforms people, and we get to be a part of that. And so, again, my prayer is that we would all take up the challenge of Scripture, get out there and start sharing our faith and being ready to do that. Why don't you bow your heads and pray with me as I close. Father God, we... Thank you so much for uh, your word. And even as we've just looked at a small portion of it this morning, and, and even just very quickly, just seeing how the Lord Jesus um, was just so good at, at having conversations and, and sharing about the kingdom of God and, and, and pointing people to eternal life. Um, I know, Lord, that that can be daunting, um, but I do pray that, Holy Spirit, you would give us... Um, courage. Um, you would, you'd help us to be able to have these conversations and have the right words that you would speak through us um, as, we, as we try um, to share the good news of the gospel with our family and friends and those who we, who we work with. Um, ultimately, out of, out of love, Lord, we know that we have received your grace and that you, you love us. We don't deserve it at all, Lord, but um, because of your grace, because of you, Lord, um, taking on our sin, you've opened the door and you, you invite us into that. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to just sit in that and, and again understand that and dwell on that and worship you because of that as we remember, um, Lord, that it is only through your body broken and your blood spilled that we can receive this grace. And so I pray that as we do that, we would we'd be mindful of those around us. And that you just build in us a burning love and burning desire for those who don't know you. That we would reach out to them and keep pointing them to the life that is in you. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.